Thank you for tuning in to our presentation this afternoon. I am Laurel Saito, the Nevada Water Program Director with the Nature Conservancy. And I'm Christine Albano, Assistant Research Professor at the Desert Research Institute in Reno. And we're going to talk about some work we're doing to quantify water requirements for groundwater dependent ecosystems. And what we're going to talk about today is what groundwater dependent ecosystems are, how we define them, and uh, we'll talk about where they are in Nevada. And then we'll focus more on what the water needs are for groundwater dependent ecosystems and how uh, we are going to try to address that question with a new water smart reclamation project that we've got going for the next several years. So groundwater dependent ecosystems are ecosystems that rely on groundwater to maintain their ecological structure and function. And they include groundwater fed springs, groundwater fed uh, lakes, rivers, and wetlands, and phreatophytic ecosystems, which are plants that have roots that tap into the groundwater, and also subterranean or um, groundwater ecosystems that are in cave systems underground. And we have all of these kinds of uh, groundwater dependent ecosystems in Nevada, partly because we have a lot of groundwater aquifers that sustain both people and nature. These ecosystems have a lot of benefits. They provide water storage and purification, preserve soils, store carbon, reduce flood risk, provide recreational and economic benefits, and they're an important water supply for people, plants, and wildlife. As you've seen by talks in this workshop, groundwater is very important in Nevada. Almost half of water withdrawals in Nevada in 2015 were from groundwater, but over a third of our groundwater hydrographic basins are overappropriated, meaning more water rights have been given out than estimated groundwater is available. So the challenge is, what do we do about this? And what does this mean for groundwater dependent ecosystems? We recognize that there are many valuable uses of groundwater, but we would like to make sure there's enough for future generations. I think the roundtable later today is going to tackle some of these hard questions. Because groundwater is underground, recognizing what the natural processes are for groundwater and what happens to it when it gets used are harder to see. To understand how groundwater dependent ecosystems fit into the picture of groundwater sustainability in Nevada, we need to know where they are, what stressors and threats they are facing, and how much water they need. In 2019, we assembled a database of indicators of groundwater dependent ecosystems in Nevada using best available data. <clears throat> Identifying where GDEs are located requires detailed local data about the land use, hydrology, and geology of a location, but we did not have all of that detailed local data available in all Nevada basins. So the database uses existing data sets to identify and map the ecosystems that potentially rely on groundwater. So we use the term indicators of GDEs or IGDEs to describe what we have mapped. The database has six mapped layers, phreatophyte communities, wetlands, springs, lakes and playas, rivers and streams, and species. And the data were mapped by hydrographic area and in one mile squared hexagons that are units used by NDAO's critical habitat assessment tool. And this link, uh, web link shown on your screen is um, where you can access the story map. And through the story map, there are links to where you can download the database if you'd like to. A few facts that have emerged from the database um, are that almost 10% of Nevada is indicators of GDE, and there are over 25,000 documented springs in Nevada. So we're now using the database to do an assessment of stressors and threats to GDE. But the outstanding question is, how much water is needed to sustain GDE? That question remains a key uncertainty in understanding water availability and for making sustainable water management decisions that balance societal, economic, and environmental needs. Methods for estimating Plant groundwater use include the use of tracers, water table fluctuations, water energy balance, and remote sensing approaches. Each of these, though, has limitations with the first two requiring very site-specific 
measurements and the latter two often being too coarse in scale to apply to narrow riparian GDEs or GDEs that tend to be small in size like wet meadows. Perhaps more importantly, these approaches don't provide a process understanding of the water needs that might vary in space and time. So this question is something we want to address and I'm going to turn it over to Christine to talk about a project we've just started to work on this question. Thanks, Laurel. Uh, so I'm going to spend the rest of this presentation giving a pretty high level overview of a new project that's funded, as Laurel mentioned, through the Bureau of Reclamation Water Smart Applied Science Grant Program. And this is a collaboration between DRI, the Nature Conservancy, and University of Wisconsin, with myself, Laurel, and Steve Lohide as the leads. And the overall goals of this project are to fill some of the gaps that Laurel just highlighted um, by enhancing some of the process understanding we need of GDE vegetation responses to groundwater availability with a focus specifically on the Great Basin and immediately surrounding regions. Uh, a second primary goal is to provide scientifically defensible estimates of GDE vegetation water needs and sensitivities to help make better informed decisions about sustainable water management um, considering these ecosystem types. And so our overall approach is to develop and test uh, mechanistic models of GDE plant water use and biomass production and to use these to generate estimates of water needs for different types of GDEs across a range of environmental settings that exist in our study area. And on the right I'm showing um, our sort of established study area, which essentially includes uh, the Eastern Sierra Nevada all the way across the Great Basin. And these colored areas indicate places within which we are actively seeking or have already acquired field data to calibrate our models. Uh, in particular, we'll be relying on a well curated 35 year data set of groundwater levels, um, soil moisture and vegetation from the Inyo County Water Department uh, for the Owens Valley of California. Uh, we'll also be including data from several wet meadows in the Central Great Basin, uh, collected by the Rocky Mountain Research Station and their collaborators. Uh, we're also hoping to incorporate some of the Southern Nevada Water Authority groundwater levels data in the Spring and Snake Valleys that Dale Devitt from UNLV has published several studies on. Um, in addition to that, we have several data sets from the Sierra Nevada, including the Lake Tahoe Basin. So once these models are developed, uh, we'll model scenarios of, uh, of changing groundwater availability to assess the GDE sensitivities to this. And we'll translate those results into a framework that can be used by stakeholders to estimate water needs based on the type of GDE and the environmental setting in which it exists. Finally, as part of this project, we'll incorporate these results into a web map application, um, probably the one that uh, uh, Laurel just described, um, and also use these to parameterize some of the state and transition models that TNC has developed to gain an understanding of how these complex ecosystems might be affected by changing groundwater availability. And these last two points are um, a ways down the line, so today I'm mostly going to focus on these first three objectives having to do with the uh, mechanistic modeling. So before I go into uh, what we propose to do, I'd like to just mention that we will be developing the project in consultation with stakeholders, uh, including those organizations shown here. And we're doing this in recognition of the fact that as scientists, we don't always know what the most useful framing or outputs will be. So we will be seeking input in the next first few months of the project on what I'm going to be laying out here today. And we'll be checking in with these folks at various stages of the project. And I'll use this opportunity now to welcome any additional participation from uh, those of you attending this Carson River Watershed Workshop. Uh, please do get in contact if you're interested in participating. Uh, we will, these workshops will be uh, generally held for the public and uh, we, we, we'd be grateful for your feedback. So to lay the groundwork for our research design and approach, I'd first like to introduce the concept of the groundwater subsidy, which uh, was developed by our collaborator, Steve Lohide, and uh, outlined in this paper uh, in Water Resources Research. 
Uh, the groundwater subsidy is a measure of how much vegetation benefits from the presence of shallow groundwater late in the season. And this is estimated by comparing water use in the presence versus the absence of, of shallow groundwater. And this is distinct from what we think of as the groundwater component of evapotranspiration, which is shown on the left here. Uh, groundwater component of ET is a flux of water across a boundary, uh, as opposed to this uh, concept of uh, benefit, beneficial um, use of water as a function of the shallow groundwater table. Um, and so as part of this project, we'll be measuring both of these using the modeling approach outlined in this paper here, um, which is essentially a one-dimensional model of root water uptake and plant production uh, focused on the beta or uh, soil layers of, of the GDE. And so to give a better picture of how these two concepts differ, these graphs uh, here are showing how water use rates for from ETG and the groundwater subsidy vary over the course of the season in uh, the Sierra Nevada Meadow and Yosemite National Park. And so at the beginning of the season, ETG is high because the water table is near the land surface. But as we go later into the season, that um, ETG declines as the water table declines and it becomes less available to the plants. At the same time, the subsidy actually increases. And again, the subsidy is the amount of additional water available to the plant due to the presence of that shallow water table. And so these two different plots um, show the contrast between the timing of, of these different uh, rates of water use. They also show the difference between a, a meadow with deeper soils versus shallower soils with the, with the meadow with thicker soils having less reliance on the subsidy because they're able to hold on to more water later in the season. And so we can similarly look at these kinds of graphs for different water table depths or different rates of change of the water table, different timings. And uh, this is what we intend to do as part of this project. And so the concept of the groundwater subsidy helps us to go beyond a simple metric of ETG, or the amount of groundwater is used, and get to aspects of the groundwater flow regime that are important to vegetation and help us to understand their sensitivities to changing groundwater availability. So our proposed research design is to apply this 1D dimensional model of root water uptake uh, developed by Steve Lohide and Chris Lowry um, and apply this to three different GDE archetypes. And these archetypes are shown to the right and what we're proposing is to include a dryland phreatophyte shrubland such as greasewood, an herbaceous wet meadow, and a riparian area. And each of these have sort of a set of, set of characteristic soils, species traits, and ranges of groundwater depth. For each of these, uh, for each of these GDE types, we'll develop three to five different models representing um, how they function across a range of different climate and soils settings. And these models will be calibrated using field data from uh, some of the sites that I, I mentioned earlier, data sets and sites I mentioned earlier. And so the minimum data requirement to run these models is monthly or higher temporal resolution groundwater levels data. And I'll mention here that uh, we are still definitely seeking out additional data sets. So if anyone here has these types of data and would like to collaborate, we'd be very glad to discuss this and uh, please contact us. So in addition to the groundwater levels data, we'll be incorporating ancillary information on vegetation, soil moisture, and satellite remote sensing data as that's available to help us validate and constrain the models. And the outputs of the modeling effort will include estimates of the groundwater component of ET, as well as several different kinds of metrics of the groundwater subsidy still to be determined, and also a metric of vegetation biomass production. And so once those models are calibrated and validated, we'll simulate scenarios of changing groundwater availability and quantify those model outputs that I just mentioned as a function of varying groundwater depths to understand how declining water levels, different drawdown rates, and changing seasonality of the groundwater regime due to warming temperatures uh, potentially affect vegetation. 
And so if you've been um, paying uh, close attention, you'll, you'll note that we've talked about looking at multiple GDE types, multiple environmental settings for each type, and now multiple groundwater regime scenarios. And so you can imagine we have a lot of factorials here. And um, in fact, we do expect to have something on the order of 10,000 or so models. Uh, these one-dimensional models are, um, not computa are computationally not too demanding. Um, and so we can take advantage of that to generate a very large, uh, what we're calling synthetic data set. And so using that synthetic data set, we can actually take the model parameters as uh, predictor variables and the model outputs as response variables to train a regression, a predictive regression model to help us to interpolate to unsampled settings. And um, so we'll be doing that as part of the project as well using a multiple regression model. As a final step, we'll translate these results into what we call the groundwater requirements for GDEs framework, where the end user can essentially identify the GDE of interest and its environmental setting attributes using readily available data sets, which could be observations um, from the field, or it could be GIS or gridded data sets. This framework would function essentially as a lookup table or um, be in the form of some other easy to use tool that provides estimated ranges of the groundwater subsidy, vegetation productivity, ETG, as a function of these um, attributes of the GDE and environment. And again, those are derived from the regression model results. So as I mentioned earlier, our goal of this project is really to provide a better understanding of water needs for GDEs to maintain ecosystem function and uh, to understand how this varies across environmental gradients because we can't model every site. Uh, in addition, these results will provide a quantification of GDE water use needs and sensitivities that we expect to be useful for planning in that it can provide information that will allow stakeholders to better weigh tra trade-offs between the ecosystem services GDEs provide and competing uses and make decisions about water allocations accordingly. In addition to this, we envision these results uh, potentially helping to refine representations of GDE water use in other modeling efforts, such as numerical groundwater flow models, uh, statistical estimates of ETG, and conceptual state and transition models, such as those developed by TNC that are used to understand these complex ecological changes. Um, so to finalize, uh, again, this is a three-year project that really uh, essentially started just a couple of days ago. And so over the next six months, we'll be further developing the conceptual framework and research design that I just outlined here. And we'll be holding a stakeholder meeting probably in midwinter. We'll spend about a year and a half on the modeling component. And then further down the road, once those models are finalized, we'll develop the web map application and uh, TNC will start to incorporate these results into their existing state and transition models. And we'll be holding stakeholder workshops at sort of key points along the way. So I'd like to close by saying thank you and please feel free to contact Laurel or myself for more information or if you'd like to join our mailing list. Um, and we'd be happy to take any questions at this point. Thank you.